Stuart, where are we going from here? So we basically have talked about everything but what people probably want to hear, which is college. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, we'll, I think we're going to graduate high school now, go to college. Yeah. For, for us, you know, we're, we're 35. We're, a, we're like a lot older than you. Um, Princeton was dominant. No, washed up and old. Uh, <laughs> Princeton, was, <laughs> Princeton was dominant um, through our childhood and really in our beginning of, of learning about lacrosse. And they've always been consistently good. That run they had in the 90s was ridiculous. Um, what attracted you to Princeton? Because it was a little bit afterward, uh, a good amount afterward since their last national championship. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it, obviously the, the story program, um, but you know, I think that the program at the time I was getting recruited, uh, definitely wasn't where they wanted to be. Um, and you know, in, in coupled with the great academics, um, it was 45 minutes from my house, which was a huge factor mm. to me just because, you know, I'm somebody like if you go to any Princeton games, like you see my family, like we travel like 20 people to a game, like mom, <laughs> dad, both sets of grandparents, brothers, cousins, aunts, uncles, like everybody comes. So That's awesome. being being in a spot where where they could drive comfortably and see me. Uh, was definitely a huge factor, but you know the other the other uh, factor for me was was just that challenge of um, you know the the program isn't where they wanted to be at the time, and for me, it was one of those things when I talked with Coach Bates, like, listen, you know we're not there yet, but but we want to. This is where we want to be, um, and and I think I was just drawn to that challenge and. I'll take it back to uh, Duncan Swayze, who was 2005 HH guy. And I remember, you know, just like overhearing my dad talk to him about his recruiting process. And at the time, Notre Dame was in a similar place where, you know, he could have went to Carolina or he, he could have went to, you know, any of these ACCs. And, uh, you know, they were winning championships year in and year out. And it's like, no, I want to go and I, I want to help build something special. And uh, for me, that that was really appealing was, you know, the challenge uh, they came along with that, both a athletically and, and academically. Obviously, I was going to be challenged in the classroom. Yeah, who were those, um, you know, when you're looking at at Princeton as you were getting into that time and recruiting, you know, were there a couple guys that you really liked in on their team, on their roster, um, that you were excited about playing with? Yeah, I mean, what was interesting at the time was just we were getting recruited so early that – I, I wasn't going to play with any of those guys uh, that were that were in yeah. the, the current locker, which was so weird, um, except uh, one of the uh, guy was a freshman, I guess, at the time that I visited. Uh, one of my really good friends was a fifth year when I was a freshman, Mark Strabo. So he was the only guy. But, uh, you know, they had, you know, Tom Schreiber, a guy that like I idolized watching him at Princeton, especially being so close. I mean, I remember driving every year to the uh, Princeton UNC game when it was at Princeton and watching him just tear out the field. Uh, and then also Ryan Ambler was always kind of, you know, one of my favorites to watch in the Philly area. And we're good family friends. And I've been lucky to have him kind of like mentor me all the way through. And he was somebody that like came from a very similar family background and uh, similar academic um, situation where, you know, we were uh, – we, we were definitely s smart guys, but we weren't rocket scientists by any means. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, so I, I think just having him and, and I talked to him, you know, more than I could count on, on one hand throughout the process. And he was just so supportive. And, you know, I, I saw his journey and I was like, you know, that, that could be me for sure. How did you feel about the early recruiting process? It was, um, you know, it, it was frustrating for me at times because, you know, I, I was at the time, you know, my club team, a lot of the guys were getting recruited by, you know, ACC schools and, uh, you know, everybody under the sun. 
And uh, for me, I, I had only heard from, um, you know, a handful of schools and uh, some great schools. But the interest, like when I would talk to them, you, you could just like tell it wasn't really there. Um, and so for me, it, it was it was a little frustrating uh, for sure. And uh, I remember, you know, being pretty upset at certain points. But um, one thing my dad kind of has always preached to me is just like everything happens for a reason. Like, it's all going to work out. You just kind of have to, like, trust in the plan. Uh, and at, like, the time, like, you know, some, some of the schools that I wanted to talk to weren't really calling. But, you know, that was always his advice. And uh, it kind of grounded me in the moment and, and just, you know, enjoy the fact that I get to talk to these amazing schools and go visit and, and meet with these players. And, uh, you know, now, like, I, I wouldn't change anything for the world, so... Oh, gratitude goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard a really good quote that really fits what you're saying uh, the other day, and I, I might butcher it a little bit, but it was something uh, along the lines of uh, college is a, uh, the college recruiting process is a match to be made, not a prize to be won. And I, mm. I, that really fits with what you're saying. And I, you know, I don't think I've ever thought about it like that. Um, but I think it's really, really true. And I think it, in that perspective, it maybe takes a little pressure off of guys that maybe are in the same situation and trying to find that, that prize, but really they just need to find the fit. And it sounds, like Princeton, it sounds like Princeton for you was the fit. Um, so uh, something else I was wondering, like and you mentioned it, Princeton is a really high academic profile. And they've had some pretty consistent success. What do you think, from your experience, culturally, in Princeton, in the lacrosse locker room, in the coaches' offices, on the field, what is it that helps them maintain that success with really that academic profile of it not being that easy to get in? It, it's definitely, I think, a, a challenge for the coaching staff because – you know, you kind of have to find the, the right mold of guy. Um, but then I think that, you know, one thing that benefits them is once you get the, the guys in, you have very similar people and very like-minded. Um, and they might be, you know, completely different in their personalities um, and their interests off the field. But, uh, you know, on the field, uh, everybody's I extremely driven and, and everybody has one clear goal in mind. And I think, you know, Last year was an example for us where we just had such a tight knit group, um, you know, on the field and off the field that everybody was always hanging out. Everybody was, you know, if it was Friday night, we were all together. If it was, you know, Thursday night, Wednesday night, we were watching a movie in the apartments all together. Um, so, you know, we, we were just so similar and we just became so close. And then, you know, from a coaching staff perspective, they just do a, such a great job of, uh, you know, g giving giving the senior class specifically a leash where they can take ownership of a team um, while still kind of guiding the formulation of the group. And I think that especially in, in an age that's so, you know, driven on, on winning as it should be, you know, like that's really unique. And I think a lot of that stems from the head coach, Coach Mads, uh, who who who's just awesome. You know, I can't say enough good things about him, but he really allowed us to take the reins, uh, especially our senior years, as he did every senior class, and kind of shape the team however we wanted to shape it. Nice. You're talking about Matt Madelon, right? Is your coach? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your yeah, head yeah. coach and um, Jordan and I know him because he was coaching at Stevens, um, Stevens Tech in New Jersey, and we played at Nazareth and a lot of great competition between uh, Stevens and Naz. But um, tell us a little bit about your uh, your relationship with Coach Mads. Yeah. Uh, Coach Mads knows everybody in the lacrosse world. Um, <laughs> he, he's like the, the godfather of the lacrosse world. But no, he's, uh, you know, like I said, I can't say, say enough good things about Coach Mads and his impact on my career and just how I approach the game. Um, you know, it, it's funny because my freshman fall uh, was definitely like a little bit rough for me. 
uh, I'm, I'm a big homebody and I was just really homesick, even though it was only 45 minutes away. Uh, school was a lot more challenging than it's ever been for me. Um, you know, socially it was different and, and the lacrosse piece was way different too. You know, lacrosse turned into more than just, you know, let's show up and, and play. It was like, you got to go to lifts. You got to be on time for lifts. You all, you all got to wear the same thing. You got to have your laundry done, your locker neat. You know, all these new little things where for me, it was just like, all, all I'm used to doing is just like showing up and playing, you know? So it was just, that was a big adjustment for me. But, you know, Coach Mads really kind of um, showed me how to how to work. And when I first got there and understand the college game, I mean, I remember going up and watching film with him and Coach March throughout my freshman year. Uh, which just gave me so much confidence that like these guys believe in me as a freshman uh, to be able to come in here and contribute. Um, and I think that like through their belief in me, I, I kind of gained that confidence in myself to really take that step forward when the spring came. Yeah, so like pretty much every coach you've mentioned, I think I've coached against. And I think we talked about that briefly on the phone, <laughs> but uh, I, I I coached when when uh, Coach Madelon was at Stevens. We when I and I was at Lynchburg. I coached against him, like, like Francis was saying. But um, Coach March there was a player at Roanoke when I was at Hampton, Sydney, and Lynchburg, play, and playing against those teams. So really cool to see uh, how their careers have changed and, and taken off. How do you think um, one of your teammates might describe you as a teammate? I would say uh, I would say very driven, uh, hardworking, but you know also like a bit of a clown in the locker room off the field. Like I definitely like to joke around and have a good time. Like in our apartments, like we love playing pranks on people you know, stealing their clothes, <laughs> hiding it somewhere. So I, I think that, uh, you know, they, they would definitely describe me as a jokester. But, uh, you know, when we get on the field or, you know, when we're down there working, I'm very focused, very driven, hardworking. Do you take the, and, it seems like you're, you know, assume a leadership role on the field just by nature of, you know, the position that you play, you've got the ball in your stick a lot, you know, do you feel the need to be the outward vocal leader within the team or do you sometimes let others take that role? Yeah, I, that's, that's a great question. I mean, for me, it, leadership has always been something that like has to come natural for me. And for me, I've never really been like, you know, uh, an alpha, <laughs> you know, yelling and screaming leader. Uh, more so, like, I'm just going to lead by, you know, who I am and, and lead by example and, you know, try and get guys to follow me that way. Uh, and just, you know, my process and, you know, how I try and approach the week and approach working through the week and how I try and take care of my body. You know, I try and lead it in that way uh, more so than, than being the, the vocal guy. Yeah. Oh, I, th I think authenticity usually breeds good leadership yeah and, and, it, and that's what it seems like you you hang your hat on and i'm sure it works you go through your time at princeton and from what it sounds like you just had a great group of friends and a great group of teammates that that you really got along with and bonded with and all you want I mean, I know from, from our perspective, we always talk about that, that locker room feeling, the, the team feeling, um, and how you don't get that back. So now you're a senior at Princeton, and what, five games in, your season gets canceled. And you're number three in the country. You're the top player in the country. Take us through a little bit what that emotional wave was like. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was, it was definitely, it was cra like crazy. Like I, I can't really yeah. even describe like that first day. 
uh, where we found out it was, I mean, Wednesday, March 11th. And, uh, you know, the Ivy I league remember. was the first to go, right? The Ivy league. Yeah. Was the first so, to, yeah. so it was, it was the NESCAC on Monday. Um, and Got we it. were like, that's crazy. Like, why would you cancel the season? The, like some virus, you know? And then, uh, Tuesday we were hearing rumors that it was Harvard. Um, and you know, all the seniors lived in the apartments together. And so like, we were all kind of hearing rumors about it and we had pen that saturday so we're like listen like like outside of this these rooms like nobody talks about this like we got pen on saturday we gotta gotta be ready to go and then you know the next day that wednesday uh whole season was was canceled and so you know i think initially everybody was just kind of like in like a state of shock like what is going on you know and i think that it, as bummed as we were originally um you know we put we quickly realized how big you know the pandemic actually was and how much bigger it was than just lacrosse and you know I think that for me and and my my roommate Phil Robertson you know like who just has like an awesome perspective on on so many different things and you know that Wednesday we have a meeting with our our coach and the athletic director who's going to tell us and everybody's like in there crying and uh, Phil's like one of the last people to walk into the room and like he's looking around and everybody's crying and like he's like, yo, like, like see, like see the big picture here, fellas. Like if this is the worst thing that that's ever happened, you know, thus far in your life, like you lived a pretty good life, you know, like this, is this thing's going to be so much bigger than lacrosse. And I think that that really kind of put it into perspective for me. I mean, within a week you know there was people dying there was people losing their jobs over this and so you know if the worst thing that happens to us is we lose our lacrosse season you know even though we just worked for four years and you know we finally feel like we kind of get over this hump we got great group of guys we're really clicking like I'm feeling really confident in myself you know just one of those things it's outside your control and you know similar to the recruiting process thing you know like it's all, I, I've always been a firm believer, like everything happens for a reason. You know, it's all part of, part of a bigger plan. And like, sometimes you don't understand that. And sometimes, you know, it's tough to see the bigger picture, but you just have to trust that, you know, better things are on the other side and better things are ahead. And, you know, that's kind of always how I tried to frame it, even though in those first couple of weeks, it was, it was certainly very difficult. Well, and you've talked about your preparation, right? And how if you prepare, then whatever happens on the field happens, right? And you got to live with it. You still feel good about your prep. Were there any regrets about the season that you were able to play? Or do you feel like you did everything in your power um, leading up to that cancellation to really maximize your opportunity? I, it's a great question. I mean, I think that, you know, similar to what you said, um, that was one thing as a senior class that we kind of were able to hang, hang our hat on. I mean, we had big lofty goals, um, that we were slowly starting to accomplish. And I think, you know, had the season played out, you know, I think we would have been able to accomplish a lot of those goals, not because of necessarily how we were playing, but just because of the work that we had put in back in, back in the, the early fall. I mean, we were doing Captain's practices on Saturdays and Sundays, shooting before practice, defensive film in the apartments after practice, like just stuff that we wanted to do to be different, um, you know, and slowly that started to play out in the season. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it, it's similar to what you just said, Francis. It's one of those things. It's like, you know, we controlled everything we possibly could up until that point, you know, and if that's the hand that, that we're dealt you know, then, then that's the hand. And sometimes you, you just have to live with that. And I guess that's the reality of sports and that's the reality of life. But, you know, we had done and we prepared as much as we possibly could. And so we kind of, you know, at that point, you just kind of had to accept reality. So one thing that um, you and I talked about briefly the other night was I think this is the most unique situation I've ever heard of with a top player in the country wanting to go back to the school he chose for a fifth year, granted that eligibility, and not being able to because of a, a, of a rule, essentially, a, a conference-wide rule. 
Um, so I guess one question I had was you had mentioned that the second there was a, a, an opportunity for you all to have a fifth year, you and all your teammates, you were talking about going back to Princeton. And that became basically not an option. So now you and all of those friends that you made are scattered across the country doing, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. Do you keep in pretty close contact with those guys? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at that point, we were kind of talking uh, on an everyday basis, you know, talking about going back, you know, and uh, so it, it was just one of those things where, um, you know, we, we were talking every day. We're still talking to this day pretty much weekly. Uh, and still, so still just kind of remain close contact with those guys. Can you um, can you clarify what that rule is um, that that didn't allow you to go back to Princeton? Yeah, it was um, it was a uh, I I think so. The rule is that you are only allowed to do eight semesters um, at uh, Princeton, and I think a couple of the other Ivies have have a similar rule. And so we we were kind of hoping to be able to withdraw from that specific semester, so mm. we would only have done seven. Um, but af- unfortunately, the the school you know made the ruling that they did, and uh, you know it, it was a shame because because originally, you know there was without a doubt it was like okay, it, it, you know I can I can remember that Thursday it was like all right well the season's over, but like guess what like we're running it back next year. You know, like everybody's coming back. I mean, we had guys like within two days that were calling their jobs that they were going to be working for. Like, hey, I got I got to go back to school. Like, can we push this? <laughs> can we push this back? And uh, you know, it, we 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 were all ready to go with it. Um, and then you know, the school made the decision that they did uh, for you know understandable reasons. And so you know, just something we had to live with. Will you um? Will you end up playing against any of your former Princeton teammates this year? Uh, no, I don't think so. No. Unless we were to see them in the tournament, uh, which, you know, it, I think is, is a good thing. I, I don't think I want to play those guys and <laughs> play the coaches. Like, it would just be too weird. Um, yeah. So I that was, you know, big draw going to Duke. Like, they didn't have Princeton on the schedule. So I was like, <laughs> all right, perfect. <laughs> Well, so let's get into that a little bit. So now you, now that you know Princeton really isn't an option for you, you have to make two pretty big life decisions. One is, do I postpone real life and I can't go where I want? I can't stay where I want to go um, and play at the school I love. Um, so do I not go ahead and take that job that I have? And then if I'm not going to do that, um, where do I go? to do the thing that I love to do. Um, can you, well, I guess the first question would be, did you have a job kind of already lined up that you had to call and, and tell them, you know, I, I got one more, I got to finish some business here or what, what, what did that look like? Yeah. I mean, so when, when it all kind of first happened, when the season got canceled, I was in uh, close contact with uh, the firm, a uh, Philadelphia-based firm that I was going to be working for starting in the summer of 2020. Um, and they've been so understanding through the whole process. I'm just super grateful for their support. Um, and, you know, originally it was, hey, you know, I, I had this opportunity at Princeton that I feel like for me personally, like I, I need to finish you know, and, you know, I need to finish with these guys and for the guys that can't come back because of work obligations that didn't have the flexibility, you know, we need to finish it for them. Uh, And so then when the opportunity kind of came up that, you know, we weren't going to be able to go back to Princeton, it was kind of like, okay, like, where do we go from here? You know, it was a similar conversation, like, hey, I have this opportunity to go play another year, but more so, you know, continue my education um, and go get another degree out of this, uh, this opportunity. And so for me, you know, like both my parents are teachers. And so like from the time, you know, I, before I started the recruiting process, like they've always told me like school is the most important thing. Like, 
you know, that's a, that's lacrosse is the vehicle that, you know, has helped you get into school. Uh, and so, you know, it was, it was another opportunity to kind of further my education while pursuing this year in, in lacrosse where, you know, my body feels great and, you know, I'm, I'm confident in myself and my abilities and I still love the game. So, you know, why not? Was the, uh, and I hope I'm, this is the question that I've been like waiting to ask. So I hope it's time. Um, when you're in the transfer wire, right, that we always hear about um, with kids in Division One sports, uh, particularly lacrosse, what is that process like, um, if you can share that? You know, are you, are you putting yourself out there? Are people calling you? Like, how does that decision, how do the opportunities come about? How did the decisions get made? Or how did it get made for you? So it's a little weird. Um, so the school, Princeton made the decision uh, on Thursday, on a Thursday. Um, and the first person that I called was uh, Coach Mads and Coach Mitch. Uh, and I was like, hey, like, you know, what do I do now? Um, and like, without hesitation, they were like, you have to email uh, the Princeton, uh, somebody in the athletic department and put yourself in the transfer portal portal. So somebody from Princeton has to put you in. And so uh, I entered the transfer portal and probably about five minutes later, I got my first phone call. And then from there, it was kind of just like nonstop, just like a full on sprint for the next like two weeks. Um, wow. trying to just like wrap my head around like this whole process. It was like, you know, on Wednesday, you know, I'm preparing, looking for houses in the Princeton area, uh, you know, trying to rent for the fall. And then the very next day I'm talking to schools across the country, um, you know, just trying to figure out, uh, what, you know, what's going to best fit me and my family for the next year. Yeah. And, uh, at this point, you know, you talked about being 45 minutes away from Philadelphia. You want to stay close to home so your, your family can watch you. How much of that was a factor weighing on you? Because obviously Raleigh-Durham is much further um, from Philadelphia than, uh, than New Jersey. So um, how, did you, how did you weigh those, uh, those important decisions? Yeah, I mean, it, my, my kind of thing with it was, uh, you know, I only have one year. And I knew, you know, for me, one, you know, like being close to home was amazing. I got to spend so much time with my family and I know that they have a ton of memories and I got to, you know, experience so much with them. But, uh, you know, I kind of needed to get away from the area a little bit to grow myself um, and be on my own a little bit. And I think that as I was going through the process, that was something that I realized more and more where like, hey, I had this opportunity to like go to a place that I probably won't be. Well, I won't be back to, you know, like, I don't know what the future holds, but, um, you know, I probably won't be back to North Carolina after this year, uh, for, for a long time, I'm, I'm guessing. And so, you know, I had, had that opportunity to get away from home and, you know, go meet a whole new group of people and get, you know, a new perspective from a coaching staff that was just going to help me get better as a player. Um, and so, you know, all those factors, you know, I was like, okay, you know, I definitely know that, I want to go play this extra year and go, go play in a new place. Absolutely. And so why Duke? <laughs> so, um, you know, it, I, I really, I, it was just kind of like a gut, gut feeling um, after I was kind of going through the process and talking with coaches as well as guys on the team um, as well as, exploring into the academic um program that I was going to be doing uh it just seemed like the best fit for me um and you know my parents were also involved in the decision a little bit and you know talking with my mom you know just kind of like bouncing some ideas off of her you know like it just kind of for me I felt like it was just the best best fit all around um and, you know, it was a combination of the academic program, the opportunity to, you know, go get, go play for Coach D and go play for, you know, Matt and, uh, you know, Coach Ned and Coach Caputo uh, and just get, you know, an awesome perspective from them, grow as a player and then go compete for a national championship. And I felt like, you know, with the talent they had on the roster, 
Uh, it was definitely going to be a team that was going to be in that, that conversation to compete. Um, and so, you know, those were kind of the factors for me. Yeah. Well, they're certainly proven to be a group that uh, has a nose for championship weekend, right? Uh, yeah. And, uh, and great coaches and my guy, shout out to my guy, Nakai from, uh, from Dallas, Texas. I had, I had the pleasure of coaching against Nakai Montgomery when he was in high school, um, which was a, a great treat for me. Um, uh, but, uh, that's great. That's great that you landed somewhere that you're happy with. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how do you feel like the transition's been? Uh, going to a brand new place with new teammates, uh, part of the country that, you know, you're not as familiar with. Um, how do you feel like your transition to becoming a part of their roster and their culture has been? You know, it, just given the uh, the weirdness of the situation, um, <laughs> you know, I think that I expected it to to be difficult and be like weird at first, but you know, I think it's just like a credit to the guys that they have in that locker room. And, you know, they have, uh, you know, on the roster that the transition was really seamless. And, uh, you know, from the day I got there and guys, you know, texted me like, yo, what time are you getting here? Like, I'll come help you move your stuff in. Um, and like going to get lunch with guys on the very first day before I had anybody's number. You know, it just kind of like spoke to the guys that they have there. Um and, you know, a lot of the seniors with Joe Rob and guys like Knack, you know, guys I live with, Cam Ulay, J.P. Basile, like, you know, those guys were just awesome. And, and it really just made the transition so smooth. Excellent. And then was there a thought to playing styles? You know, were you looking at Duke and, you know, seeing a guy like Jordan Wolf and saying, OK, like, you know, my game and his game may be a little similar. They'll let me play the way that I like to play. Um, you know, did, was that a part of the process? It, it definitely was a little bit. Um, I think more so it was just like the opportunity to go get coached by, you know, Coach Matt and Coach Ned um, and Coach D2 and, and just get their perspective, you know, on my game and, and some of the things that, you know, I could work on to get better myself. You know, I felt... Like I watched some of the games that they played and obviously I watched, you know, all the 2014 Duke with, you know, Jordan Wolf senior year. And, uh, you know, I definitely felt like I could fit into that system, um, but more so it was just, you know, this opportunity to go get coached by two former tour time winners, two of the best to right. ever play at the college level, at the pro level. Um, and, you know, I just felt like for me as a player, that was something that, you know, I, I was just going to get so much better from, and I was really just going to benefit from. Got it. Um, I know you probably haven't gone out to a ton of restaurants. I don't know what's going out and going on in North Carolina, but um, have you embraced the sweet tea life yet? The sweet tea? Yeah. Nah, nah I can't say I had. <laughs> I I actually my my roommate got me into tea a little bit, but I've never really been a big tea guy. No. Okay. That's one of the things when you go out to dinner or go out to eat in Raleigh, Durham, a lot of times the first thing they offer you is water or sweet tea, which uh, I learned <laughs> because my, my high school coaches took us out to Duke for a couple tournaments. So that was always a lot, a lot of fun for, for us. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I'll have to keep an eye out for that for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, I think the the best thing about restaurants in the South are – you have the opportunity for homemade sweet tea and there's Dr. Pepper as an option. You, Cause you had a whole fall basically. You had a, a maybe an abbreviated fall season, um, but certainly practice time with your new team. Um, was there like an instant chemistry with anybody in particular? A lot of times what I've noticed at least is um, talent often has chemistry with talent and I don't think Duke is lacking talent right now. So adding you, uh, as another piece, was there anyone in particular or a couple guys, uh, that you felt like you kind of just clicked with right away? Um, you know, uh, the, well, one of the nice parts about transferring down there was an opportunity to play with one of my best friends from Princeton, Phil Robertson. So, 
that was definitely a guy, you know, playing with for four years. Like I, I knew I instantly had chemistry with. And so in those early scrimmages and early practices, like I was able to kind of like lean on him a little bit as we were both trying to adjust to the new system. Um, but, you know, in terms of individual guys, like, you know, a guy like Dyson Williams, like you can literally shoot the ball at him and he's going to catch it and put the ball in the back <laughs> of the net. Um, you know, and, uh, Brennan O'Neill is another one that, you know, throw anything in a 10 foot radius and he's going to come down with it and sting a corner. Um, so, you know, it, it, playing with, with all their attack men, though, you know, they're all so skilled. They're all so fundamentally sound and, you know, it speaks to the drills that we do on a consistent basis where, you know, you, you really know where a guy's going to be, uh, you know, before the play even happens. And that's just kind of, you know, how they do things and standardizing everything. So, you know, we were able to kind of all get, all get a chemistry, all get on the same page, just kind of how we were going through basic drills. What's a culture piece at Duke, you know, a blue devil culture piece that's been new for you um, to, uh, to really hold yourself accountable for a different aspect of your game or, you know, what is, uh, what are they really, challenging you to do within your own game i mean the just kind of get back to the fundamentals and and i think you know for me you know i've learned so much in in the short time frame that i've been there and it's really been challenging for me um just because you know it, it's a new perspective um and to, for me to kind of get back to the fundamentals and get back to just just making the simple plays and the basic plays and you know, the high efficient overhand shots and the Jordan Wolf jump shot where I'm used to coming around and dropping my hands and going low to high. You know, that's been something that, you know, has been very new to me. Uh, but that's exactly, you know, why I chose Duke in the first place was to go and get that perspective and get that coaching. Um, and, and for me, you know, it's been awesome. And, and I felt myself grow as a player um, and be, be challenged on the field, you know, physically, but also mentally where, you know, every single day I'm getting coached and I'm getting coached, you know, just like every every other guy, you know, similar to how I was at Princeton. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's been it's been very great. The best players want to get coached. It's simple. <laughs> the best players want to get coached. I hope that any young person who listens to this uh, hears that message because um, I'm just – summarizing what he said it's from his from his experiences um the best players want to get coached and that's really refreshing to hear um and so i want to ask this too um coach danowski what are some similarities and i know it's been kind of a short time with coach danowski what are some similarities and or differences between coach madelon who's kind of a younger coach and coach Janowski, who's really a seasoned veteran coach. What are some things that you see that maybe they do similarly? What are some differences? Um, all positive, of course, but what are some of those things? Uh, the main similarity, they definitely both love to talk. Uh, like I could, I could talk to coach D and I could talk to coach Mads. Like literally if I called it, Either of them, I don't think I would ever have a conversation less than like 30 minutes with them. Um, now, the difference is with Coach Mads, like we would talk, like Coach Mads is like the biggest lax rat. Like we'll talk about other things, but like we'll talk about lacrosse. We'll talk about like, you know, everything under the sun. Like with Coach D, like we'll talk a little bit about lacrosse, but then like we're talking about like, you know, history or we're talking about like he's got this, uh, he was telling me about this. He's got this beaver in this pond in his backyard uh, that, like, he, he would love to talk about. We talk about it for, like, 20 minutes at a time. Um, so the main similarity between the two, they, they both love to talk. Uh, they're both great at talking. I want to ask you a question because we've talked about, you know, your dad's a coach and his influence on you. And, and you mentioned your mom a, a little while ago and, um, we finished last week talking to um, a mom of uh, a mom in lacrosse, and so I wanted to ask you, like, how 
influential has your mom been in this journey or how has your mom been influential in this journey um, throughout your life in lacrosse? My, my mom, me and my mom have definitely a very different relationship than me and my dad. And like, for me, uh, you know, as like a, a really competitive athlete, like it's just, it, it's been like so ref refreshing. I mean, for, with my dad for so long, like, you know, 90% of the conversations that we're having, they're about sports, um, which, you know, I loved, but at the same time, you know, my, like my mom kept me grounded and, you know, my mom, uh, was always somebody that like, I could just lean on. Um, she's got great emotional intelligence. Like she's just always like, you know, she always knows what to say. She always knows how to comfort me. And like through, especially throughout my freshman fall, I mean, uh, at Princeton, I think I probably called her every single night, you know, and like sometimes like she would have to, you know, talk me down off of the cliff. Like I was just so mentally in over my head and like, you know, I, I re I was like, mom, I don't know if I could do this. And she got me through, you know, that initial stage. And, you know, she, she just always kind of said like, you just keep, keep pushing forward. Like, you just take your next step and like everything's going to work itself out. And so, you know, she's kind of been like, uh, my, my, my foundation through this whole thing. You know, she's just always the person that I fall back to for advice or, you know, for, you know, the comforting conversation that everybody needs sometimes. Love that. Mama Sowers. We thank you. Yeah. Got, got a shout out. You, we got a shout out mom. You got you, that mom, right? you got you. Moms always know. They always know. Do you still have that job lined up in Philly? Yeah, so, you know, my plan right now is to begin, uh, you know, hopefully full time in the summer of 2021, this upcoming summer, uh, you know, living in Philadelphia, which is a move that I'm really excited for. And, uh, you know, excited to be able to, you know, go give back and, uh, you know, work for the people that have been so supportive uh, for to me throughout my my journey, my weird journey the last couple of years. And I mean, I'm going to ask this more as a formality, but do you have any plans on playing lacrosse at the professional level? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, my, my plan is as long as my body holds up, um, you know, and, and right now it feels great. You know, I have like every intention of the world of, in continuing to, to play the game. Um, you know, it's definitely, especially with professional cross and where it's at now, it's just so fun to watch. And I can only imagine how fun it is to play and, and, uh, you know, how much fun it is to be a part of it. So, you know, I definitely have every intention to play. That's great. Do you have well, any we... in Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, do you have any uh, experience playing indoor? Is that I something do, you might be interested in? Yeah, I do. So I do have uh, experience playing indoor. I actually, I played every summer. Um, I would play in uh, a box league, the PBLA down in South Philly uh, at uh, the Rizzo Rink. It's like this gritty uh, kind of like outdoor, <laughs> indoorish uh, skating oh, rink. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, they. I mean, they got some good guys down there. It's uh, it's definitely not the junior A up in Canada, but uh, it's uh, it's a, it's a blast, and you know, I love the pace of the game and the physicality of the game and the toughness aspect and you know the angles. It's something that you know definitely challenges me. Um, but uh, you know, I I love the the aspects of the game. It's just so much fun. Well, I was going to say that, uh, you know, we we really hope your your body holds up. We hope that this season holds up um, and that you're able to to take full advantage of the place that you put yourself into. Um, and we'll be we'll be watching with we would have been watching anyway, to be honest, but uh, we'll be watching with it with an added uh, interest in in seeing you and how your season plays out. Um, and we're really excited for you to to embark on that journey. Yeah, I really appreciate it. All right, gentlemen, Michael, pleasure to have you on. 
It's awesome to have you on, bud. Uh, so funny how the lacrosse world works. It is a small world. Uh, we, we have to do a pod maybe on that alone, maybe a mini soda on that alone. <laughs> um, but it's crazy. It's funny because Eddie Coombs, who you mentioned uh, at length, an awesome individual, actually met uh, – however many years ago when my cousin Gannon was in that same recruiting class at Marist, Marist College. They were, uh, they were good buddies. Um, Mr. Coombs, one of a kind, awesome guy. Uh, one of the loudest, uh, most boisterous people in the stands. Uh, great person to have at the games to fire up the crowd. Um, really awesome. I just want to give a shout out to, we saw you rep the hat, the Edward Taylor Coombs Foundation. Uh, awesome stuff. My cousin Gannon goes to that golf outing every year, just Super cool. Uh, the legacy of 34 at Marist. Just really awesome. Um, but yeah, just wanted to, to say how crazy it was, how small the world was. And, and uh, you know, that's just how it goes. So, you know, we're on a Philly trend right now. Right, Michael? You're oh. a Philly guy. We're on a Philly trend. Yes. So, so the snake in the draft for today, this is kind of how it works, right? So it's essentially uh, a mock draft. I'm going to give you guys nine items um, and we're going to go down the list. We're going to pick. Michael, you're our guest. You have first pick. Uh, then we're going to go Francis and Jordan. It's going to snake back to Jordan, Francis, and then Michael, you get two on the turn. Uh, so this this week, again, Philly-centric. It's Philly must-haves. So I'm just going to put it in the chat real quick. So we're going to go off nine things that, in my opinion, are Philly must-haves, and then we're going to draft these uh, accordingly. So it's going to go the Rocky <laughs> franchise, the Philly Birds, the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, the Liberty Bell, Meek Mill, Cheese Steaks, <laughs> It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, uh, Silver Linings Playbook, uh, Roast Pork Sandwiches, Fire, and The Roots, <laughs> the band. Awesome band. So, again, no, Michael, no, you're up. No Wawa? We can't get Wawa? Now. I was going to say, no <laughs> Wawa. That's kind of a Jersey thing, too. So, yeah, I didn't want to cross, you know, state lines and, too, too and much. And Delaware. And Delaware. You're right. You're right. It does have a, it touches a couple states, but Michael, I know it's a tough list and a tough list to go through, but what's your top pick for Philly must haves? All right. Top pick off the board. I, I feel like this is a no brainer. Philly birds got to be. <laughs> I'm glad you picked them. That's Michael, tough. I, I was just going to say, I'm glad. <laughs> you I mean, it's it. easier. It's easier now after this weekend too, when you saw your boy hurts out there and Wentz yeah. uh, took a seat on the bench. They, they look pretty good this past weekend. No, for sure. It hurts. Vic 2.0, I'll call it right now. <laughs> He's going to be a stud. Wow. But no, I mean, the uh, the, uh, the the 2017 Super Bowl run, like, I mean, that was just like the greatest oh, yeah. thing that ever happened to the city. We actually, we we drove down there the night that they won, and uh, it was just like mayhem. Uh, <laughs> it was like the coolest thing I've ever seen incredible it was incredible um i will say that uh francis you are up sir you have pick number two i you know i'm a big food guy um i'm gonna go cheese sticks i gotta go um let's do it i don't you know with uh, with whiz yeah i'm gonna go i'm gonna go all in (laughs) i put that on there i didn't i didn't know how mike what michael thinks about that i know where he stood on cheese steaks but again Roast pork is still on the board. A nice Denick's roast pork sandwich. Uh, we'll see if these two fellas uh, know anything about that, Michael. Jordan, you're up. You have two back-to-back. Well, obviously I'm going Rocky franchise. That's, so that's, <laughs> that's two times uh, in a matter of three episodes that I've picked Rocky for something first. So Rocky franchise, 100% mix. Got to go. It's a, it's a no brainer for me. Um, and then, okay. I got to go Meek Mill. I got to go Meek wow. Mill. So I have to. And here's steal. why. I think it's a steal too. I agree, Sean. And here's why. Philly rallies around Meek Mill. They do. The, the, the city rallies around Meek Mill. Um, how hyped... Do you get watching the Eagles get hyped to a Meek Mill song? <laughs> right? What's cool? I don't know. Mike, we, we know Michael's a, a Drake guy, though. 
you know, and what do we, what, how do you feel about the beat, Michael? Nah, Come on. Let nah. us hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> I, that, they squash you gotta that. Stand, you got to stand with the city for sure. I think <laughs> the coolest, the coolest meek, uh, meek moment for the city was the dreams and nightmares for oh, before yeah. the Minnesota game yep. or uh, legendary when his first day out of jail. Uh, when he when he drove back with Michael Rubin, Scooped they flew up. in the mm-hmm. helicopter and he rang in the Sixers. Yep, I remember watching that live. I was like, this guy should be mayor right now. Like- <laughs> <laughs> a legend, a legend. That's amazing. That is too funny. Uh, Francis, back to you, and then Michael, you have back to back picks on this next one. Uh, I'm gonna go Silver Linings Playbook because I like to have a movie with my cheese stick. Um, also Jennifer Lawrence, sorry. Too easy there. Too easy. All right. (laughs) Great movie. Michael, you have two, uh, back to back. All right. Les is getting a little thin. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I guess I gotta go. Liberty Bell has got to be off the board here. For sure. I mean, just the Philly staple. Um, and then I'm embarrassed to say, but I've never had the famous the next roast pork. But I'm going to take it off the board based off of recommendation. Okay. Feel like okay. <laughs> Strong. That's on the list. I think that's what, Reading Terminal Market, right? Right there yeah, in Philly? 100%, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And it was it was cool what they did. I saw this year they had a GoFundMe to help save uh, all the small business owners there. Such a cool spot. Everybody who may not have been to Philly, awesome spot. I always recommend uh, going there, checking it out. Really cool. Good choices. Good choices out of you. Your list is looking pretty good so, so far. So, uh, yeah, man, <laughs> of course. All right, who's up next? Uh, I guess it's me. Um, I'm taking the roots. I'm taking the roots. I'm taking them off the board. Uh, my man Quest Love, just uh, you know, after I'm done with my movie and my cheese stick, I gotta add some tunes. <laughs> there you go, Jordan. You're up. Well, you know who I, I didn't bl- include because you're a Knicks guy. I didn't include the Sixers for you. So, just oh, thank yeah. me later. I do appreciate that. Um, I believe that leaves me with it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm that that's what we're left with. That's amazing. I I feel pretty good about never it on my it. board. Never seen never it. Have either. Oh. <laughs> never, so, I've never wow. have either. Oh never have I ever. No. Oh man. <laughs> Everybody's watched it. I I don't know. I mean, I'm a huge T V show guy. Um, mm-hmm. but I don't know why. I never got into uh Always Sunny. Okay. What's your show? Okay. Are you a Game of you Game of yeah. Thrones guy? What's the deal? I I, I definitely was Thrones, but uh, okay. S- Jordan, shout out! I I uh, Friday Night Lights too, <laughs> like favorite show. So That's like the guy. at school, I'll just and same thing now. Like I'll literally fall asleep every night to like a random Friday Night Lights episode or The Office. Amazing. Or the yes. Wow. Also the Office, language. Jordan. You guys speak in my language. Uh. Those are those are my two all time. I mean, two of my all time favorite shows. The Office is honestly in our house. The Office is background noise. Like instead of having music in the background, we have The Office. <laughs> <You're on> the <laughs> office. <laughs> my my daughter has like little figurines of The Office, right? Like she she pick pick up a figurine and be like Pam. You know, it's like one of her first words. It's kind of, that actually is that crossing the line? Is that okay? Maybe a little yeah. okay. Um, can I ask one more question from our friend Michael Sowers here? Mm-hmm. What's Michael? What's the game for you? The game that, like, the lacrosse game, the college lacrosse game, that like you could watch over and over again. You probably have it memorized. Like, what's your game? Is there one national championship? Anything? A game that you did not play in? The the um, twenty fifteen. No, it wasn't twenty twenty fourteen. It was I I 2014 or 2013 Albany Notre Dame at Hofstra. Oh yes. The quarterfinal yes. where yes. Kavanaugh, yes. Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh hit there. the game winner. That yeah. I I can't find the full game anywhere. But no, those it's not online. Yeah, I, those highlights, uh, inside lax highlights. I've probably seen it over 40 times. 
Insane. Yeah. And nothing again for me, nothing against Notre Dame, but I was devastated that Albany didn't win that game. Oh, you know, it was just like the story, it. right? The story yeah. you wanted yep. to see it play through or play out. Love it. Great catch. That's awesome. Well, listen, fellas, another success, successful draft. Francis didn't go out of turn that we know of. Uh, Michael, again, awesome. Thanks for having you. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And listen, we're excited to watch you play this upcoming year. And here's to here's to the best for you, sir. Yeah, sir. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, boy. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Nobody's Nailed seen it. It's Always Sunny. I thought that was going to be a hit.